Certainly the events of this past week from a financial point of view have changed a global perspective for all of us. Amen, church? And for many right now in, in the world, all over the world, they're hurting. Now, that's one of the things that I think that I've learned in the last several years of ministry is that people are fragile. Even after you become a disciple, you can be fragile. I know that Elena and myself, having particularly gotten into several people's lives here in the congregation the last couple of weeks, as well as going to Portland and then down to Eugene this past weekend, we've seen that there are a lot of disciples that are hurting, or in the terminology of the world, going through a meltdown. That's the title of our lesson today, The Meltdown. Let's look at a meltdown in Psalm 77. The writer writes in verse 1, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O God, and, and I groaned. I mused, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years long ago. I remember my songs in the night when my heart mused and my spirit inquired, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? This guy is hurting right here. He says, I can't sleep at night. My soul is faint. I'm hurting on the inside. God, where are you? And that's certainly the cry a lot of people around the globe have this weekend. But there's also that same cry by many disciples in the church. I want to look from the scriptures at several things that can cause a meltdown, even inside the hearts of disciples. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians 4, verse 1, Paul's talking to the church, and he says, Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for my joy and my crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I mean, Paul just had an awesome heart for the brothers and sisters there at Philippi. He looked upon them as his joy and his crown and his friends. But look at verse 2. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, to help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. One of the things that can cause a meltdown in a disciple's life is conflict in relationships. Particularly with another person who's quote-unquote sold out. I mean, right here we have two sisters that must have been incredible ladies, Yodia and Sitiki. Both of them, it says, were fellow servants of the Lord with Paul, fellow yoke servants, and their names were in the book of life. They were doing okay in the sense of their salvation. But you know something? They just couldn't get along. There was conflict. And you know, if there's anything that can steal our faith, it's conflict with another disciple. Are you with me right here? You know, persecutions from the outside can be damaging. But when there's conflict from another brother or sister, it can be devastating to our faith. We can begin to be full of self-pity, which means we start to focus on ourselves, and we start to become weary and lose heart. Why? Because it destroys our idealism. You know, in a great sense, you know, we're baptized in the Lord, and we're coming into God's church, and we expect everybody to be perfect. Surprise. They're not. See, there is no such thing as a perfect church. Why? Because you and I are members of it. But we've got, to, we've got to understand right here. This conflict must be resolved. You know, we had an excellent time in Portland on Thursday and Friday, but then on Saturday, Elaine and I drove down to Eugene, Oregon, which is about two hours south of Portland. 
And we got with several disciples there. But in the morning, we got with two dearly beloved couples in the Lord there. The Cherimellas and the Hackett's. I mean, Jeremy and Amy have been doing a great job, not only leading the June church, but also kind of spearheading our global internet ministry. The Hackett's, I mean, they're kind of the, the pillar of the church down there. And they're an incredible couple. They've been dear friends of Elena and myself since the very first days that we were in Portland. We used to go down and have discipleship partners with them down in Eugene and dream about the day there would be a church planting in Eugene. Well, over the last several months, these, these two couples, fellow Yoke fellows in the Lord have been in conflict. And it's really hurt both of their faith. And so after talking to both sides, okay, we all need to get together. And you know, that's one of the things that sometimes we can get so hurt, we stop trying to resolve the conflict. And in the Lord, that's why we have brothers and sisters. We got together last Saturday and we talked very frankly. And that's the great thing about being a disciple is we get to speak the truth in love to one another. We don't beat around the bush. We try to be gentle. We try to be sensitive. On the other hand, we got to get the Bible on out and call each other to be what God wants you to be. And it was often, I mean, you know, there were some tears. There were a lot of hurt things, but people were bringing up the things that they'd been hurt. And these were long-term things that they just hadn't been brought into the light. And as we talked, you could just sense the healing that was taking place. But you know... There are a lot of people who have conflict with fellow disciples in the church, and they even can feel lonely in God's church. Have you ever felt lonely in the church of God? It's because you have grown weary, and you're suffering a meltdown. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Previous to this scripture in verse 27, Paul just shares all the ordeals that he's been through for the sake of the gospel. And then he writes in verse 28, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? The second thing that causes a meltdown is pressure. Is pressure. Now, right here, Paul's talking about the pressure, the responsibility of all the churches. And certainly, some of us in the congregation, if we're Bible talk leaders, if we're house church leaders, we can, we can have a sense of the pressure, the responsibility of brothers and sisters, and it's just overwhelming. Others of us just feel the pressure of life. You know what I'm talking about? And it can cause you what? You begin to lose your faith. Why? Because you start looking at yourself, thinking about yourself. You stop thinking about God. You stop thinking about other people. You start throwing a great pity party for yourself. And your faith begins to wane. You know, it's also very interesting right here. There's a third reason in this verse that a meltdown occurs. He says, who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is letting the sin I don't inwardly burn? Have you ever had a close brother or sister just do rotten spiritually? And you hear like they may be falling away. You just get that pit in your stomach. I mean, you feel this weakness come upon you. Almost a nauseous feeling. Or sometimes maybe a study didn't come through that you thought, oh man, this person's absolutely going to get baptized. And there's that hit to your faith. Or like Paul, he says, not only does... Weakness come on in when we begin to see the fragileness of of disciples around us and our own fragileness. But when brothers and sisters fall into sin, you know, it's just sometimes instead of just feeling weak, we just get upset. We're just so mad at them because we know they're wrecking up their life. Do you know what I'm talking about right here? You know, we need to understand these things can produce a meltdown. Let's keep going. Back to Philippians 4. Verse 10. Paul's talking to the church of Philippi again. He says, I rejoice greatly, Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you've had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whether... Whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry. 
whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. The church said, right here, he's talking about finances. When he's talking to the church of Philippi, he says, well, you finally renewed your concern for me. He's saying, finally, you're paying me again. And he says, but you know something? In, in the midst of my 25 years of being a disciple, because Paul's about 25 years old, let's stop right here. He says, I've learned something. I have learned to be content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether having a lot of money or I have nothing. And it simply comes down to, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. See, when we focus on our finances, we focus on where we're going, so often it just steals our faith. And as Jesus talked about, the spiritual thorns of life choke our spiritual life and make us unfruitful. You know, a couple that I really so appreciate the faith of is Tony and Therese Antelande. And uh, Tony and Therese sacrificed so much to move down here and be a part of this congregation. And I hope that we appreciate them just as disciples. But in coming on down, it put a huge, huge financial pressure on them. Things were undecided about their house. That was a pressure. Not only did they have a house payment, but they had the rental payment. Not only that, but Therese had to resign her job with no job down here. And their finances don't really work unless both of them are working. Maybe you can relate to that a little bit. But in the midst of all of this, they did not lower the pledge that they gave to God about how much they were going to give financially every week. Let's look at Malachi. In verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, old descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, well, how are we to return? Well, the man robbed God, yet you robbed me. But you ask, well, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crop, and the vines in your field will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Right here, where the remnant people coming back to God. And they were gathered back together. But God says, return to me and I'll return to you. And they say, well, yeah, we want that. And God says, well, why then are you robbing me? And they say, what are you talking about, God? He says, you are robbing me by not giving your tithe and your offering. And because of that, you're under a curse. You know, a lot of us in this financially hard time, we think, well, I gave my pledge when things were better. And so now God will understand if I pull back. No, no, no. You gave a pledge. And once you give your word to God, then you need to follow through with it. You see, when the Antelons came on down here, they were hard-pressed financially. But they continued week after week to give to God what they had promised him. And you know something? Just this past week, Therese got a job. Their finances are in shape right now, and God has blessed them. Maybe you're having a financial meltdown because you're pulling back the finances to your control instead of surrendering them to the Lord. Amen? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. So far, we've seen conflict with other disciples, pressures of life, weakness and sin in other disciples' life. Finances cause meltdowns. Let's look at another one. Hebrews chapter 12. We looked at this briefly last week. In verse 7. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. You know, we enter the kingdom of God. Not only thinking that all of our relationships are going to be awesome. But we think, oh man, now that I'm a Christian... Life is going to be problem-free. 
You know, often when you get baptized, that's when your real problems begin. Because now you have some convictions with what you're living by. And the Bible says right here, endure all hardship as discipline from God. In other words, God is sovereign. Whatever, whatever hardship comes upon you, either God makes it happen or he allows it to happen. But here's what happens many times. We come into the kingdom, and maybe we've even been in the kingdom for years. But our life is just not turning out as we thought it should. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, you begin to lose faith. Often you come into the kingdom and go, oh man, I'm going to be married to an awesome brother in just two years. I just know it. <laughs> Ten years later, you're going, wow, has God let me down? You come into the kingdom and you go, oh man, discipling is going to straighten out my husband. And you're still having conflicts. You come into the kingdom. You say, oh, man, it's great. My children will be raised in the Lord. And then one of them falls away. God, this isn't what my picture was. I pictured the perfect marriage. I pictured perfect children without sin. <laughs> Often the affairs of life. We picture ourselves in a certain job, in a certain position, and that doesn't happen. God, why haven't you blessed me? Or maybe you didn't have the grades that you wanted to have to go to a certain university. Or maybe the circumstances of life are you didn't even get to go to university, let alone complete it. And you're going, God, this isn't, this isn't what I was expecting. And you see, a lot of us have these ideas of how our life is supposed to be. And we endure a hardship, and what begins to happen? We begin to have the meltdown. You know, it was really awesome uh, being up there in Portland. A few weeks ago, the Portland International Church of Christ decided to leave the new discipling movement. And for a lot of disciples inside that church that wanted to be a part of a movement, they just fell just in a total meltdown mode. And they were so sad and so down. And yet many of them, and I'm very proud of them, many of them literally got together, started praying, and the Holy Spirit started moving. And I'm telling you, it was awesome being down there this past Thursday night and Friday night with them. Friday night, we had almost 50 disciples gathered. And many of them signed on up and said, yes, I want to be part of the new movement. I want to be part of this new church. And they were so encouraged to hear about the mission team that's coming down from Los Angeles. You know, we've got Ron and Tracy Harding. That's awesome. Amen, guys. And the cool thing is they've already got a spot to live. It's the, the exact apartment where Aurora was baptized in the fountain right in front right there. Uh, also, Gordo Esparza is going on down. And he's all fired up. And the beauty of being a movement is the fact that we can pool our resources with other churches, not only finances, but people. And so Janelle and Marcel from Phoenix are going. Now, that's, that's awesome because the Phoenix Campus Ministry has been one of the fastest growing ministries in our entire movement. It's grown from 6 to 26 in the last nine months. Marcel and Janelle have been kind of the number two couple, so to speak, propelling that ministry. And yet Phoenix is sacrificing them for the sake of of building something even greater there in Portland. Even Eugene, who's given so much in the last several months to different plantings, they're giving up two awesome disciples, J.B. Furman and a sister who's praying about it and hopefully going to say a yes answer today. Amen? <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. And when the disciples heard that this is what the other churches were out doing, I mean, they were so fired up. You should have heard the singing on Friday night. It made you cry. It was so incredible. No, no, you're right. It wasn't how all those disciples thought it should be. But when people have different convictions went a separate way, what's happened now is now we have a church that's like-minded with us, that has a vision to evangelize the world, that believes that everybody should be in a discipling relationship that believes that we need to have overseeing evangelists so that we can be a unified fellowship so no matter what city you go to, you're going to be welcomed by that church. 
And so what's happened now, you have a stronger base of disciples in Portland than you've had for the last couple of years. It's maybe not the way you and I would have gone about doing it. But let me tell you something. God has done it, and he's blessed that particular congregation. Are you with me here? Let's look at one more thing that causes a meltdown. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Beginning of verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the suffering of Christ flows over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. Yes, broken dreams cause us to have a meltdown. But perhaps number one on the list is despair. Despair. Right here, Paul just pours out his heart. I mean, you, you feel him with Paul right here. All that he's going through, in his particular case, seemingly because of the harsh persecutions that have come his way, that have literally threatened his very life. Of course, we can expand that even to health areas of ourselves. We can despair of health. We can despair of our lives and all the pressures that have been brought about us. And he says, listen, this has happened for two reasons. Number one, Despair has come my way so that I will not rely on myself, but on what? On God who raises the dead, the God of the impossible. Well, that's a good thing. Amen, guys? And secondly, he says, despair has come my way so that after going through it with God, then I can offer comfort to those that are going to go through the same exact suffering. This not only comforts them, but remember... Despair can take you out of the kingdom. So it's not only for a fellow disciple's comfort, but for a fellow disciple's salvation. Are you with me right here? You see, despair can motivate us or isolate us. Motivate us or isolate us. I think about one couple, the Chins, who live in Delaware, the state of Delaware. And uh, after all the things that happened in our former fellowship, they just kind of got out there. They saw the church they're in was pretty dead. And so they said, well, we're going to try to make it on our own. And they started dying spiritually. And what was the thing that was timed out? Well, he was a dentist, and she was a physician. And if you know anything about this, you know, you own your practice. And then they heard about the mission team that was coming to Washington, D.C. with Andrew and Patrick. And they read about everything. They even went to go check it out, and they started driving the distances. But, you know, when you're driving two-plus hours to church, it can start to wear on you and cause you to go into despair. But, you know, that despair didn't isolate, but it motivated them. They're selling their practices, which is a huge sacrifice, and they're moving to Washington, D.C., How about it? As a non-Christian, is despair isolating you so Satan can attack you? Or is it motivating you to become a disciple? How about it as a disciple? Is despair isolating you so Satan can attack you? Or is it motivating you to do whatever it takes to be strong in the kingdom of God. You know, to most people's surprise, Jesus went through a meltdown. 
Turn to Matthew chapter 26. To give you the setting, we find these are the final hours of Jesus' life. He's just had what we call the Last Supper with those that he'd walked with for three years. They go out, have a song. On the way, he shares with them that they will all deny him. They come to the Mount of Olives to pray. And we read this in verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watching me for one hour? Yes, Peter. Watch and pray so that you'll not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour's near. And the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Wow, is this intense or not? We find these disciples, they're with Jesus, but they're really not. This is his darkest hour. He knows everybody is going to desert him. As a matter of fact, he knows that even one of the 12 will betray him. Yet he takes the faithful 11 to the hill called the Mount of Olives, and he tells eight of them, you guys stay right here and pray for me. And then he takes his three closest guys, Peter, James, and John. And the Bible says right here, he speaks to them, he gets open, and he begins to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he just totally gets totally open with his life. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You know, anything that Jesus did was not by accident and was absolutely necessary for his salvation and for the salvation of the world. One of the things that helps to overcome a meltdown is getting open with your life. It's becoming transparent. What's the main thing that stops us from being transparent? Pride. We don't want people to look down on us. And then we sometimes already have pride in us. We look down on people. So I just don't think they could handle this much sin if I get open about it. Can you imagine being the son of God? Can you imagine being Jesus and having to get open with these three derelicts right here? Guys that were going to betray him. But he had to get open. I think one of the most powerful things about being open and transparent is that once you speak it, it's brought into the light. And then you see how gigantic it is. You know how we minimize sin in our mind? You know how we minimize troubles in our mind? And yet when we speak, whoa, whoa, that's huge. I don't think that Jesus, once he spoke these words, minimized his situation. He says, my soul's overwhelmed with sorrow. To the point of death. Some have said that Jesus, since he was tempted at all points that we are, even had suicidal thoughts at this point. I don't know. The point is, it was too much. He was having a meltdown. And then we see what he does after he gets open. He goes to God. Even as with Paul, when he said, These things happen so that I might not rely on myself, but on God who raised the dead. Jesus separates from the three, and he just falls face down on the ground, and he prays, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, 
Not as I will, but as you will. What is the cup he's talking about? Well, it's the cross, but it's more than that. It's the suffering on the way to the cross. After praying that, he goes back to the disciples. They're asleep. Luke says they're exhausted with sorrow. They also are having a meltdown, but they're handling it so different than Jesus. I mean, I think it's interesting to me. Jesus is getting up, my soul's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Well, how do you think the disciples were feeling? The exact same thing. But they were silent. They were exhausted, Luke says, with sorrow. But they said nothing. They're exhausted and led them to sleep instead of to pray. How often do we do that? We fail to get up early enough to have that time with God to be able to make it through the day. Or when we've had a rough day, we said, you know something, I'm just going to kind of chill out, watch TV, hit the sack. Just a total disregard for God. Instead of taking out a half an hour just to be with God in prayer. He goes back, he prays again. They're asleep again when he returns. The third time he comes back, I don't think he was expecting him to be there. Whether he was or was is immaterial. He was now ready to drink the cup. For Jesus, it took three straight hours of prayer to get his heart matched with his head about doing the will of God. Have you been struggling with some decisions right now? If you have, you know what you need to do. You get open, totally transparent about what's going on, not worried about what people are going to think about you. You totally, unashamedly open, and then you go to God to pray to the point where you said, Yes, Father, I'm ready to drink the cup of suffering. I will do your will and not my will. Are you with me here, church? Turn to Hebrews Chapter 12. We looked at verse 7 earlier. Endure hardship as discipline. God's treating you as sons. But let's go to verse 1. The writer of the Hebrews is actually writing to people who've been Christians for many, many, many years. And he says this to them in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand, of the throne of God. Consider him who endured this opposition from sinful men so that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. So that you'll not have a meltdown and fall away from God. Again, let me underline. He is talking to people who have been Christians for years and years and years. If there's anything... We could say it was first principles. It's the basic of the Gospels. Chapter 12, you might want to call last principles. Because you better get this down or you're not going to last. This is perhaps as challenging, as mature of teaching as you could possibly have to understand. These three verses of Scripture. We find right here. The bottom line, the writer says that your Christian life is like a race. It's like a marathon. What's happened, as we alluded to last week, in America, we've come to believe that as we age, life should get better and better and better. We should be able to build up a great amount of money to buy a cranking house. We'll lay aside all the money we need for retirement, and then we just eat, drink, and be merry. And they forget the last part, and then you die. And that's the mindset we have. And so 
Many disciples who, because they're disciples, are forced to sacrifice many things in order to stay faithful to God. They've got to go to the cross in order to stay faithful. Many of them begin to get weary because it doesn't match what they thought. I've been in the kingdom now 10 years, 20, 30. My life should be cranking awesome. And it's harder than it's ever been. Can you relate to that a little bit? It's because you don't have a scriptural view of what it means to be a Christian. As a Christian, you're following Jesus. Now think about Jesus' life. Did it get easier and easier and easier as he got near the cross? Why do you expect any different? Why do you expect any different? Why should we expect, if we're in a marathon, that mile 10 should be harder than mile 20? Mile 20 is going to be really tough. I mean, the furthest I've ever run is 17 miles. I've never made it. Marathon. I'm telling you. People talk about hitting the wall at mile 20. I was hitting the wall at mile 12. And I can tell you, mile 5, I was doing okay. Mile 12, I was hurting. I got home at mile 17. I just laid on the floor comatose. (laughs) I was hurting for days. But I made it home. And that's what we got to do. We got to make it home. Amen, guys? Now, what's the thing that we deceive ourselves with? Well, we say, well, the reason my life is so hard is because people have sinned against me. They've done me wrong. Well, look at what they say about Jesus. Verse 3, consider him, that's Jesus, who endures this opposition from sinful men. What was the opposition? They killed him. They flogged him. So that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. See, we've got to focus our eyes back on Jesus. And the moment you focus your eyes on Jesus, you're going to feel that weariness begin to dissipate. You'll find that heartsiness with which you were baptized begin to come back. Not one single circumstance will have changed in your life, but you're going to have a totally different perception. Because you're not going to view it from a human point of view, but from Jesus' point of view. Are you with me right here? See, we need to understand that Jesus endured the scorn of the cross, the suffering of the cross. He drank the cup of suffering for the joy set before him. For Jesus and for God, it's all about salvation. That's why we suffer. Turn to Acts chapter 16. We read right here, in the middle of the chapter, that Paul is going around in Philippi preaching the word. But he has kind of a a funny thing happening as he and the brothers are going around. They've got this slave girl, who evidently was a, a fortune teller, going around and trailing them. And wherever they went to preach, she would be yelling out, Hey, these men are servants of the Most High God who is telling you the way to be saved. Now, that was absolutely true. But it sure hurt the appeal to a sermon. You know what I'm talking about? Try sharing your faith and someone's yelling, Hey, these people are going to save you. These people are going to save you right here. Paul just, after after a few days, he got so ticked off. He says, Demon, come out of her. And the demon came out of her. But then she couldn't foretell the future anymore. You know, a lot of people even today get so mixed up. They think, well, this group does a miracle. That group does a miracle. Let me tell you something. There are two sources of supernatural power. One is God and one is Satan. Be clear about that. Don't get faked out. Don't get pulled into false doctrine just because a miracle happens. Satan is far more powerful than any flesh. And so right here, when that happened, the guys that owned the slave girl, they got ticked out because they made their money from this woman Telling fortune. So they get the whole city stirred up against Paul and Silas. And we pick it up in verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. 
And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were crying and grumbling about the toughness of their life. Is that what it says there? Shh. Let me ask you. Did you have a tougher week than they had that night? I mean, they're beaten. They're stripped. They're put in prison. What do they do at midnight? They're praying and singing. Let's continue to read. How about me? I Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. I mean, you might say they were a captive audience. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly there was a violent earthquake. And you know that's God, right? Amen, guys? That the foundations of the prison door were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open. Everybody's chains came loose. Now, you've got to understand, the practice at this time with the Romans was that if one of your prisoners escaped... You would be killed. Let's read on. Verse 27. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't, don't, don't harm yourself. We're all here. I mean, this guy was having a meltdown. <laughs> the jailer called for lights, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, he's not asking the spiritual question, what must I do to be saved? He's saying, what can I do to live? But you know, Paul, he never misses an opportunity. He goes, glad you asked the question. They replied, believe in Lord Jesus, you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all of the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all of his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and he was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, he and his whole family. You see, Paul's suffering allowed him to give salvation to the jailer and his entire family. Now, it may not have been the way you would have gone about it, but it was the only way to give a testimony to the jailer that there was something different about these guys. I mean, after all, if you're beaten and if you're flogged and at midnight you are singing and praying in the jail, you are different than anybody else you've ever seen. When the earthquake comes and all the fetters are unfastened and there's an open door for your escape and you stick around when your captor's about to commit suicide... You are different than anybody has ever seen. So when the guy comes begging for his life, what must do to be saved? Paul says, you've got to believe in the Lord. Let's go study the Bible. <laughs> Let me tell you something. They had his attention. They had his respect. Why? Because of suffering. Because they were willing to drink the cup of suffering. It set them apart. It was obvious they were from God. The singing, the praying, the earthquake. It was obvious these men were from God. Now, this guy was having a meltdown. He was about to kill himself. In our society, there are two things we don't talk about very much. One is suicide and depression. And the other is molestation. These are things our society still is not open about. This guy is about ready to commit suicide. Do you know how many people all throughout L.A. were ready to commit suicide last night? And some did. Their life was full of that much despair that they didn't want to go on with life. And so when they speak the word of the Lord to him, this guy goes, that's it. That's the answer for my life. Now, he still didn't know what was going to happen to him in the morning. He didn't know, and later on we find in the text that, believe it or not, Paul and Silas go back into the prison. Is that incredible? But as a sign of repentance, before he could be baptized, he washes the wounds of Paul and Silas. Most likely, he was the one that inflicted the flogging on him. 
And so to wash their wounds and to bandage them would have been his repentance. And the Bible says, not only did he get baptized, but his whole family goes, oh, wow, you guys are so awesome to my dad, to my husband. You're obviously from God. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow morning, so we're going to be baptized tonight. If you will, turn to Romans 6. Romans 6 talks about what baptism is all about. Paul reminds every disciple in the Roman church. In verse 2 he says, we died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Don't you know that all of us were baptized into Jesus? We're baptized into his death. We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You know, we understand that many churches teach that all you need to do is to just say a prayer and you will be saved. And yet the Bible says that in order to be saved, you got to be born again. To be born again, you got to lose your life. How do you lose your life? You die with Christ in the waters of baptism. How do you get your sins forgiven, which is where you, you get in a relationship with God? He says you come in contact with the blood of Jesus when you share in his death. When that blood touches you there in the waters of baptism by faith, then when you come up out of that water, what? You have a new life. All your sins are forgiven, and you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit to give you the power to live the Christian life. I understand about the jailer. I remember on a Sunday night, a couple guys sat down with me and laid out what it meant to be saved. I came from a super religious background. I came from a background where you believe that praying Jesus in your heart. And I believed it. I changed my life. And I felt saved. And yet, when I read those scriptures, whoa. My first reaction wasn't, oh, yeah, great. You know, I need to submit. I was mad that they were saying I was lost. And yet... I went back that night, studied the night, got up the next morning, studied the morning, came back, talked to the guys on Monday night, and Monday night, kind of early Tuesday morning, at 1.30 in the morning, I was baptized into Christ. He said, well, why didn't you wait? Because I didn't know what the next day held, and I really believe it was at baptism that you were saved, because of your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, sadly, Elena and myself... uh, we're really hurting for Michael Williamson. Uh, Michael's lost his mom a while back, and so for him to lose an aunt was just oh, so devastating. And it just really hit Michael, but we felt in a joy that it just worked out. You know how God just does that? It just worked out that we were there in Portland in order to go to the funeral with him. And it was, it was, it was a powerful time to see the family come together. And they had a sharing at the beginning, and Michael was the second person to get on up. And he says, you know something, I, I just got to repent. He says, family, I, I, please forgive me. I have not been loving. I've not stayed connected. And it was awesome. It affected his whole family. Then a bunch of other family people come up, yeah, I've got to repent. I've got to. It was awesome. <laughs> and then, I mean, the preacher was laying out. It was an African-American church. And those guys can get worked up just a little bit. And there there were some great points that he made. But then at the end, he goes, and now, in view of the fact that this woman has died, who of you wants to be saved? If you want to be saved, you come forward at this time. Amazing to me, a white guy and a black guy come forward. Older guys. Just in one sermon, they're coming forward. He says, just pray, and you'll be saved. He says, I know, and this is a group of maybe 100 people. He says, I know there are others out there who are just afraid to come forward. He says, you come forward for prayer and we'll pray for you. Another 15 people come forward. They're crying. And I thought to myself, wow, in 100 people, there are this many people open. We confronted with death. That they want to get right with God. 
And yet they're being told false doctrine. All you have to do is say a prayer. Don't worry about repentance. Don't worry about baptism. And I go, wow. These people are going to go home happy, but deceived and not right with God. You know, church, we need to really consider Acts chapter 16 and change our view of the things that are causing a meltdown in our lives. And instead of despair, we need to understand that by drinking this cup of suffering, two things happen. We no longer rely on ourselves, but we rely on God, and that's what it's all about, being a disciple, amen? And secondly, by going through the suffering we go through, we then can comfort others that follow, if we've been faithful, as they go through that same suffering. And it's during the times of suffering that people can see the biggest difference in who we really are. I mean, if life's going great, we look no different than anybody in the world. But when life is going rotten and the world is having a meltdown, but you're fired up because you have God and maybe nothing else. But you've learned that same secret of Paul to be content, whether in plenty or in want, because you believe I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Thank you. God bless.